Kayvon Thibodeau going number five overall to the Giants in this year's NFL draft was a good sign for Oregon football. Him being the only duck drafted this year, eh, not as great. What does all that mean for the state of Oregon football on the recruiting trail? We discuss today. Here we go. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked on Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin, D1 play-by-play broadcaster and lifelong Oregon Ducks fan. Thank you for making this your first listen or your first view if you're watching YouTube every day, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks every single weekday. Like, comment, subscribe wherever you are listening to and or watching the show. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online where the game starts. Yesterday with Ryan Winter, by the way, was uh, Star Wars Day. And I have this beautiful piece of Star Wars artwork behind me in my brother's apartment where I'm recording this episode in Anaheim, California. And I realized that I forgot to point out that it was Star Wars Day yesterday. So I apologize to all of those who recognize it for the beautiful, wonderful holiday that it is. I will just say off the top, and you can roast me in the comments if you would like, Rise of Skywalker is the worst, and Rogue One is the best. You may debate. Let's get into the football talk today, because this was an interesting draft for Oregon football. They had a lot of guys, the most in the conference actually, go to the combine, and then only had one player drafted. Now, a bunch signed his undrafted free agents. I'll get you updates on where all of those guys are because there are a flurry of them who are all over the league right now trying to make rosters. But let's start with Kayvon Thibodeau. Now, him going to New York, it certainly fits his personality, right? It, it, you go to a place like that, you know the media attention is going to be a lot. You're in the Big Apple, and there's going to be people who, who write a lot of things about you because it's a big media market and fans are pretty rabid over there and they expect a lot of things, right? So all of that, I think, fits very well with him because he's very comfortable in his own skin and he's very prepared to have that sort of exposure, to be in that sort of environment. You know, some guys are more suited to go down to Jacksonville and just kind of hide out and be good football players and that's it. But Thibodeau, New York, I think that fit works uh, really well. I like the team fit to a certain extent as well, get to that. But he is Oregon's eighth top 10 pick all time in program history, just the eighth, which is kind of a crazy number when you think about it. It feels like there would be more, except a lot of them have come really in the last decade or so because this is the third straight year that the Ducks have had a player taken in the top 10. Before Panay Sewell and Justin Herbert went inside of the top seven, actually, The previous top 10 picks were uh, DeForest Buckner at number seven in 2016 and Eric Armstead more, more, or most recently those two guys, uh, he was taken number 17 overall in 2015. So not a top 10 pick, but was a a first rounder as well. So those have been Oregon's kind of big name draft picks. Then there was Deion Jordan back in, uh, I think it was 2013 was when he came out after that uh, Fiesta Bowl last year with Chip and his career is uh, not lived up to that sort of promise. But I think Thibodeau shows a, a lot more traits than Deion Jordan did when he was in college at Oregon. I, I thought Jordan was overdrafted at the time, but I thought he'd be better than, than what he's become in the NFL. So Thibodeau goes to the Giants, and he fills a need on a team that just doesn't have very many good players so, you know, plenty of people will discuss and pay attention to some of the off the field stuff that he does and says, and he's very camera ready and he's not shy. And as I said, that all fits in uh, with with him very well. And I think won't be a distraction for him. I don't think it'll be too much to be in the New York media market, but on the field is where they need him to stand out. And, and Don Martindale or Wink Martindale, as you might know him, don't know how you get that sort of nickname, but it's kind of cool. Wink Martindale as a defensive coordinator. Um, I said this earlier on uh, an episode a few weeks ago, looking at Thibodeau going into the draft, and I had the chance to ask Mel Kuyper about it as well, and and he concurred that Wink Martindale is a good defensive coordinator in the league, and he's been on some really good Ravens defenses, 
And it, he thought that that was a good place for Thibodeau to go. And I asked him, you know, where should or, or where, where would Kayvon go that that would be, you know, kind of a good fit for him, allow him to get close to the ceiling. He mentioned the Giants at five or seven. Of course, they ended up taking him at number five. When, when you look at a Kayvon Thibodeau going into the scheme that Martindale is going to run defensively, there's going to be a lot of man-to-man coverage, is which impacts him a little bit on, on the defensive line because it's his responsibility to help out his corners by getting after the quarterback so they don't have to cover for as long. But in third down situations, which is where Thibodeau, as we know, is at his absolute best when you know that the other team has to pass and he can just put his hand in the ground, rear back, use his amazing, amazing get off, which is easily his best trait, in my opinion anyway, and get after the passer. And so when you're in those situations, what Martindale loves to do is blitz a lot, runs a lot of cover zero, doesn't put safeties back there, just wants to go man to man, mano a mano, and bring as many guys as possible. Why I like that for Thibodeau is because he'll be able to avoid double teams in those situations. And we saw double teams. Heck, we even saw triple teams for him this year. There were a couple snaps against UCLA where he legitimately had three offensive linemen on top of him. It, it was a pretty ridiculous. And as far as the concerns about his motor, Eric Armstead had those too. That's one of the reasons I mentioned him earlier uh, as one of Oregon's recent top first round picks is I think his, you know, energy level or uh, consistent tenacity that he brought on, on a play to play basis. I thought Armstead was way worse with that in, in college than Kayvon Thibodeau was. And th- there were concerns there about Armstead. And I think there were more Oregon fans. I remember my dad and I talking about it at the time, uh, with some people we know who are Duck fans who'd noted like, yeah, he can be really good, but boy, he really vanishes for a long time. I never felt like we said that about Kayvon Thibodeau as often as we did about Armstead back in the day. And Eric Armstead is now a Pro Bowl caliber player. If you have the physical traits and you can get into a scheme that's going to work for you, then you're going to succeed. And I think Thibodeau was set up at least you know decently for success. The problem is the Giants are terrible. <laughs> They are really, really bad, but he has the opportunity to to shine. That's the that's the plus side for him, right? He's he's not going to get lost in a field of really good players who are putting up great stats, and, and you know he's just another guy out there. Like, no, he he has a chance to be the best player on a bad defense and you know a bad team overall. And they took Evan Neal with their seventh pick, the offensive lineman from Alabama. So we'll, we'll see how that works out for the Giants. I, I'm just fascinated to watch Thibodeau. And myself and a lot of Duck fans will be taking quite a few victory laps. I'm sure we'll be doing them together. If Thibodeau ends up becoming a highly productive player and all the people are saying, oh, his motor's not very good. And, you know, does he really have enough this and that? And yeah, he was the number one overall pick for a couple of years, but we're going to move him down. Maybe he'll go in the 7-10 range. Yeah, so all of those sorts of people, I don't know why they talk like that, but apparently they do, according to me. All those sorts of people will uh, be hearing it from me, but it it's a two-way street. If there are people out there who think, oh, no, Thibodeau's going to be, uh, t- he's got no motor, he's too distracted, he's too this, that, and the other thing, and he's too distracted in New York, yada, yada, yada. All right, if he ends up not working out, you can come fire at me. At Smalls underscore 55 or at Locked on Ducks, slide right up into the direct messages. You can get a question answered here on the show as well, or you can go in there just to tell me that I'm a moron and I don't know what I'm talking about, which, you know, that's okay. You won't hurt my feelings that bad. I'll tell you why Cave on Thibodeau going number five is a good look for the Ducks after I tell you about Bet Online, your number one source for all your betting stats and sports info. Find all the latest sports developments, league reviews, and news, including this year's basketball playoffs, Major League Baseball, and this weekend's run to the roses as the Kentucky Derby is back. Bet Online is your continued source for all your sports wagering information from live betting to playoffs, esports, and more. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. Bet Online where the game starts. Kayvon Thibodeau going fifth is another good look for the Ducks. You want, as a college football program, to be able to send players to the NFL at a high level who, who are going to you know at least have chances to succeed. They aren't, they aren't all going to work out, but just the very idea of them getting drafted and then seeing that come to fruition, I think is a really great branding opportunity for your school. 
it's you know kind of free marketing. I, I say kind of because there's a lot of work that went into getting Thibodeau to Oregon and, and getting him on the field and keeping him healthy and all that sort of stuff. But you know, I'll say it's additional marketing for your school, and it, it's a it's a good thing because it's the third straight year Oregon's had a top ten pick. Right, Panay Sewell went seventh to the Lions, and then Justin Herbert was fifth in 2020 to the Chargers. I also remember certain concerns about Justin Herbert when people kind of overthought him and he was the third quarterback taken in 2020 that's played out. Um, probably not the way a lot of people thought Anywho, I talked recently here on the show about Oregon and recruiting and the idea of, do you want to have an identity on the recruiting show? Do you want to be known for one position in particular? And my answer is no, I would like to be known in a perfect world for being able to recruit any and all of the positions because the teams that get to the national championship games are doing just that. Clemson has had Trevor Lawrence and Deshaun Watson, but also Hunter Renfro and Mike Williams and uh, uh, Travis Etienne goes to the NFL and uh, Christian Wilkins was a top pick and they've sent players from all over the place, Alabama, every position imaginable. And so this being the Ducks third straight top 10 pick, at the third different position, I think is a great look for the program overall, even though we're going across coaching staffs here now, as we move into the Dan Lanning era, this is just a really good example of what I'm talking about is you want to have players at a high level come through at several positions because you have to have a team. You have to have a well-rounded team if Oregon is going to get that first coveted national championship. You can't just have good guys at two or three positions. No, you have to have high caliber players up and down the roster. It's why we talk about recruiting so much because the teams that recruit really well tend to win at a high level. That's the way this works in college sports. And so I'm just a fan of seeing Thibodeau go in the top five because he, he deserves it. And there was all the talk about him going down seven and 10, but I think it's a great look for the Oregon football program and their ability to go on the recruiting trail and pitch to recruits. Yeah. If you come here and produce the way we know you're capable of, you can get drafted in the NFL and you will be a top five caliber pick because we've had three top seven picks in the last three years in a row. And then in 2016, there was a top 10 pick. And, you know, all this sort of stuff. And, you know, I, I just reject the notion wholeheartedly that I want to be known specifically for one position. Like, I don't really care if we look at the Dan Lanning recruiting trail successes and failures individually in, you know, three or four years. And we say, boy, they tend to be really good at this position in particular. Oh, OK, that that's fine and all. But I don't think that should be the stated goal of the staff. They should be looking to get players at a multitude of positions who are going to contribute at a high level. You know, I mean, you know, who's known for one position right now, Washington. And yeah, Washington has sent more players to the NFL since the PAC 12 became the PAC 12 than any other team in the conference. But would you rather have been Oregon or Washington over the last 10 or so years? I think we all know what the answer is going to be not just because of the fandom we have all been given, or at least some of us, since birth. It's been a better program because they don't just have one position. Yeah, it's great. Washington can send a bunch of DBs to the NFL, and that's really, really good. And they sent Vita Vea as well, but they haven't been getting the guys offensively to carry them to where they want to go. It's been primarily on one side of the ball, and so that's why I reiterate once again, I don't want to just be known for one position. You got to be able to do them all. That's what the best coaches and the best teams and the best programs are able to accomplish. And that's what I want to see Oregon do because that's the standard that, that I hold them to as a fan. And, you know, positional versatility on the recruiting trail will breed more positional versatility on the roster going forward. I mean, Seven McGee, who's a D'Anthony Thomas-like player, as we've talked about, grew up idolizing D'Anthony Thomas. When guys see players on teams that they like at schools that they could potentially want to go to one day, and they see themselves you know, as that sort of player, they think, oh, well, maybe I could become that. You know, 
a high-end defensive end who Oregon is pursuing right now, a couple of them, as I talked about here on the show, in the class of 2023, Mateo Uyunglele, Jaden Wayne, David Hicks. I think Hicks is an interior defensive lineman, but if you don't think it helps for those guys to be able to look at a player like Kayvon Thibodeau, see the success that he had and how he's been able to translate in that into you know personal success for himself on and off the field, if you don't think that other high school players look at that, go, boy, I think I could do that. And I'm that caliber of player. I would say you're wrong. I am not implying that many of you think that I am just pointing out that I believe that that helps. And so you see a guy, you know, if you're Jaden Wayne and you see Kayvon Thibodeau go number five, after having played at Oregon for several years, you think, well, that's the kind of place where I can get the exposure on, on national television and the opportunity to play in front of, you know, rabid fans at Autzen stadium that, you know, help our defense and all that sort of stuff. Like that sort of stuff, it, it snowballs, right? It all comes together to put the puzzle pieces in place to get a recruit like that. And I, I think that's a good sign for Oregon that, that Thibodeau was able to go number five and, and that I think he'll have a successful career and that, the concerns about him mostly overblown. I think the most valid one is that he doesn't have a huge array of pass rush moves. That was a big issue his freshman year, but he's improved. And if he continues to to maintain the work ethic he showed at Oregon, he's a much more dominant player in his third season than he was in his first. I mean, he was a much different, much improved player. I think he got a little bit bigger when you just look at him on TV. He looked like he bulked up a little bit, was a little faster, a little bit stronger. If he learns to become a well-rounded player, he can become a dominant defensive end in the NFL and be a Pro Bowl caliber player. I can't wait to watch him. And, you know, it's not exactly the same as Herbert because Thibodeau's not a quarterback, but will I want to watch the Giants more than I did this past season because Thibodeau is going to line up a defensive end? Yeah. Yeah, of course. And that's why college football in the NFL have such a great relationship and why they work together so very well. Kayvon Thibodeau got drafted and nobody else this year for the Ducks. That was really, really strange. I mean, Verone McKinley is a first-team All-American in 2021. Mikhail Wright took a step back in 2021, but was uh, you know ha- someone who had a really good career, an All-Pac-12 caliber performer. Both of those guys were expected to be drafted. And when I when I talked to Mel Kuyper Jr., I said, who are the next Ducks off the board? He was very confident both those guys would be selected. Now, they were going to be later round picks. That was always the projection. You know, McKinley was at best going to go in the third or fourth, but I thought Mikhail Wright would go in the fifth and McKinley maybe, you know, kind of late in the fourth. The fact that neither were selected really surprised me. I'm not totally sure what happened there. With Verone, I think what you have is a lack of elite measurables. He ran a 4.65 40-yard dash. That's actually slower than Kayvon Thibodeau ran at the Combine. He's only 5'11 as well. So, you know, he, he was every bit as impactful of a player as Javon Holland was while he was with the Ducks. Holland maybe a little bit more so, but McKinley this year and Holland last year, man, they were, dude were, dudes were studs, absolute studs when they were playing in the secondary. And, you know, at their peak, I I couldn't stand the thought of having either off the field because they were so darn good. But Javon Holland is bigger and Javon Holland is faster. And in the NFL, everybody's bigger and faster. And so I think that's ultimately why McKinley wasn't drafted initially. He signed an undrafted free agent contract with the Dolphins, ironically. So he reunites uh, with his old secondary pal, Javon Holland, assuming he's able to make the roster. But I I just think that if you are a first team All-American performer, you lead the country in interceptions. If your measurables are not great, in my view, that shouldn't, get rid of your draft stock, it should lower it, right? Is If he if he had Javon Holland's traits and put up those numbers, he's a, probably a second-round pick. <laughs> I mean, you lead the country in interceptions, first-team All-American, that tends to catch some eyeballs of coaches and scouts. But instead, he goes undrafted. He's in Miami. 
I hope he gets a chance to make a roster because he's one of the one of the smartest, most instinctual players I, I have seen in Oregon secondary in quite some time. And you know, we've had some good safeties come through, John Boyette and TJ Ward, and it, it, there there have been a number of them. Who, who have played on the back end and been really nice players. And McKinley is up there. 2021 Verone McKinley, you know, as a freshman in 2019, he, he was a, a nice piece to have on the back end, but he developed into the anchor of the back end of the defense this past year. And that's, you know, a credit to his work ethic because he, he grew tremendously into a really, really good free safety. Mikhail Wright is also confusing because he has the physical traits, and, and he's also a great return man, as we know. Took a couple kicks to the house and had some big returns. So the fact that he didn't get drafted also really surprised me. I would say less so th than Verone, but really they're, they're pretty similar. I expected both to be taken, and I didn't think anybody else would get drafted. You know, maybe Verdell later in the rounds, but you know, if you go back to the episodes where I was leading up to the draft, talking about, you know, where these guys could go, Thibodeau was obviously going to be top 10. I thought Verone would be in the third. I thought Mikhail would be in the fifth and everybody else an undrafted free agent. And it turns out Thibodeau was the only guy drafted. And that was just really, really strange. I think with Mikhail, right, what you had was a bad 2021 hurt him. Was he a bad player? No. But did he perform the way I thought he would? after his 2019 and 2020 seasons, when I was watching him and asking myself time and time again, is this a first round caliber corner? And he took a major step back on the field in 2021. And so I think that hurt his draft stock a, a lot. And a number of Oregon fans, I'm sure, and I know that at least a few feel this way is, boy, they, they should have stayed in college. Are they getting bad advice? And I'm not going to speculate on all of that. What I what I will say is it's frustrating as a fan when you see a guy who, who's that good, like either of these players are and have been for the Ducks for the last several years. When you see them go to the NFL and not get drafted, it's frustrating because you think, well, did you need to come back? And uh, man, how good could we have been? And this didn't work out the way that you thought. You know, I remember when when Kenny Wooten and, and Lou King left that 2019 Oregon team, I thought neither one is ready for the NBA and neither one was ready and neither one has has made the league in, in a significant way. So uh, I, I think, you know, Wooten's been on a couple of G League contracts. I don't remember about Lou King. I haven't checked in on him uh, recently, but in terms of them coming back, Verone McKinley could not have increased his draft stock. You know, he maybe could have upped his uh, 40 time on, uh, you, you know, if he worked on in the off season. But was he going to lower it substantially? No. I, I mean, you can improve the number that you put out there, but ultimately you're only as fast as, as you really are. So how much quicker could, could he get? And he wasn't going to grow at all. So off of a first-team All-American season, I understood why he went to the league. His draft stock wasn't going to be higher. And that seemed like the perfect storm to, to get him as a mid-to-late-round pick. NFL scouts and GMs saw it differently. Mikhail, on the other hand, definitely could have benefited from another season, knowing what we know now. I thought he was ready, you know, a, a little rough around the edges, perhaps, in man-to-man -man coverage, but really good in zone instinctual can, can lock on to defend defenders, pretty good ball skills. He could have benefited. It, it appears from coming back to college for another year and probably been a draft pick. Instead, he, uh, he, he got to latch onto the Seahawks recently to, to try and earn his way into a contract. So I, I, I think Mikhail, you know, would have benefited, but Verone led the nation in interceptions was the best player Oregon had all season long on defense because Thibodeau was in and out of the lineup with, with some injuries and whatnot. He was the most consistent. And when both of them were on the field, Thibodeau was the best. And then it was Verone. But, you know, uh, McKinley led the Oregon defense and was a really, really good player leading the nation in, in picks in 2021. So I, I think those guys just, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know on Verone because, like I said, 
those sorts of measurables, yeah, they should be a knock against you, but I don't think they should get you not drafted. I mean, a first team All American just not getting drafted, that's uh, that, that's a little bit strange. Wrap up today and look at the fr undrafted free agent signings that, that have been made for all the other Ducks that went to the combine, had their names in the draft, and unfortunately didn't hear their names called on, on draft night. So McKinley went to the Dolphins. CJ Verdell, this is a fascinating one. He gets signed to the Colts, and the reports are that he's going to be in a battle for the, uh, the number three running back slot in Indianapolis with Max Borgie of Washington State. So a little Pac-12 duel going on there. And, you know, I have enjoyed watching C.J. Verdell run because he's been incredibly productive and he runs hard. And I always thought he brought it every game that, that he played. I would take Max Borgie in a heartbeat. And, you know, I, I like Verdell, but Borgie brings more to the table. He He's good between the tackles the way C.J. is, and he, he's physical, but he's a better pass catcher. He's got way better agility, and he's much better at making guys miss in space. Verdell's probably a little bit more physical, right? Can finish runs a little better, but I, I hope Verdell is able to win that job and carve out a role because I love watching uh, pro ducks, but I would be surprised if if he were able to beat out uh, Max Borgie for that slot. Uh, both Anthony Brown and Devin Williams end up on the Ravens fighting for some roster slots. George Moore, the fourth to the Packers. I thought Moore might have been, you know, a, a sixth or seventh round pick, but you know, I mean, he's got uh, he's got the size. I don't know if he's got great feet. I think that's kind of what what held him back there. But those Mario Cristobal offensive linemen, they tend to be really, really good. Johnny Johnson, the third, got to Houston as an undrafted free agent. And uh, Mikhail Wright, as I said, uh, is with the, the Seahawks trying to earn his way into into a contract. And, um, you know, I, I just feel like there, there has to be something that we don't know that we're missing, like a, a disagreement about a contract or, or something or a, a, a dollar figure or maybe I don't know. I'm just speculating there because how many of you Oregon fans coming into this draft thought, well, you know, by the end of it, you know, once the free agents get get handed down or whatnot. Anthony Brown will find a team quicker than Mikhail Wright. Yeah, I didn't, I, I didn't see that one coming either. Now, Anthony Brown might not make the roster. The Ravens are literally the only place, I think, where he could have a shot because he's a tremendously mobile quarterback. But uh, that, that one surprised me a little bit. I mean, good for A.B., but you know, I, I don't know how far he's going to be able to get. I'll be rooting for him. I know some Duck fans are, are are done with him entirely and don't want to hear from him again. But anybody who plays at Oregon, I just I grow a personal affinity to it. And I hope all these guys succeed. I hope they all make the roster. I, I think Devin Williams has a chance uh, to do that, and George Moore as well. I think Johnny Johnson and, and CJ Riddell have got a, a tougher battle ahead of them, and, and the other guys will cross our fingers and uh, and hope for the best. And fear not. You should like and subscribe wherever you're listening to or watching the show right now because I will continue to cover products here on the show because I know that you're following them. I am as well, and it is a lot, a lot of fun. I appreciate everyone listening. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and go Ducks.